My name is Justin Williams. I'm a butcher at Harlem Shambles. And today, we're going to butcher a whole lamb into all the cuts that you would typically see in a butcher's case. First off, we're going to remove the neck. The neck is a cut that would be used for stews or stocks, not necessarily to be used on its own, but it very well can be. You can debone the entire neck, wrap it up with some herbs and make a very nice roast out of it. But also if you're making any type of soup or stock, the neck is probably one of the first places I'd go to to get as much flavor and bang for my buck. Up next, we're going to take off the shoulder section. The way that we're doing it here is to find the fifth and sixth rib, which is where we want to define the shoulder from the ribs. This animal weighs around 50 pounds and we can expect just about a 100% yield since we're working with the whole animal here. Every single thing on the animal, sparring glands or anything that's too unpalatable, you can use for a good use, be it the bones, be it any excess fat, any meat that's trimmed down off of a cut that you intend to then tie or turn into a chop of some sort. Up next, we're going to focus on the rib section by counting how many ribs we have in the lamb in the first place. The lamb can grow to either have eight ribs in the rib section or nine ribs. We got lucky this time, so somebody's going to get a rack with nine ribs on it. The rib section is typically what would be seen as a ribeye on a cow. You get your rack of lamb. You can also get some cuts that aren't typically seen in many butcher's cases, such as the lamb breast, which is great for tying into a roast. You also get the spare ribs, which don't look like much on a lamb, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. The next thing I'm doing is I'm removing the kidneys and the kidney fat from the loin or the saddle, because if that were a horse, that's where you would sit and put them right to the side, save it for that kidney pie that you're trying to make or pie crust with that lamb fat. Here, I'm looking for where the top of the sirloin bone is in respect to the back of the saddle. Once I find that, I know I want to cut as close as I can to that sirloin so that my saddle section is as large as I can get it. And then after I'm through all the bone, I then finish my cut through the other side and I should then have my full and complete saddle. So these are the primal cuts that you will get from a lamb. You first have the neck, the shoulders, the rib, the saddle, the kidneys and kidney fat, and the legs. Next, I'm going to break down the shoulder. The first thing I'm going to do is split the shoulders in half and deal with them independently. And we'll first do that by sawing right through the middle of the spine to then have two equal halves of it. So now that the shoulder split, I'll then be taking off one of the shanks so that we can do a boneless shoulder roast. The shank can be treated as its own cut to then be braised. It can go in a soup. Anything that's low and slow with um, a moderate amount of moisture, then you can end up with a really nice braised down tender cut of meat. Lamb is different in the way that it has a specific flavor profile to it, which lends itself to different applications than you would normally find in beef, pork, and chicken. Mostly that's due to unsaturated fats being very prevalent in the animal, which then oxidize and give themselves off a sort of unctuous, gamey flavor. More so in overseas lambs than you would see in an American lamb, but at the same time, it opens up a completely different profile to cooking with meat in general. So now what we're doing is we're exposing the meat off of the blade bone and writing a seam that separates basically the brisket and the rest of the shoulder. And we're also going to trim some of the unnecessary fat and fascia just to get everything nice and evenly shaped. So right now we're going around and underneath the shoulder blade. We're trying to keep that flat iron and that scotch tender of the lamb nice and intact. To keep as much meat in the roast as possible, it's best to work around the bone and just make sure that the tip of your knife stays on that bone, staying very shallow and making your cuts very precise and having the animal work around you, not so much you working around the animal. Moving the cut around constantly definitely helps out in this case. So now we're going to do a little bit more tunneling since there's a bit of a pocket where the shoulder blade then goes into the arm bone. All you need to do is get a little bit of a quick twist and you can pull them both out. So we have our blade bone removed. Now we're going to finish tunneling out the rest of that arm bone right there. 
So just a few more careful cuts on the inside of that shoulder meat and then we should be able to do a quick little twist and spin and just pop it right out. So then we go ahead and start trimming off some of the undesirable parts, such as this little stamp that the USDA puts on the lambs, which that's actually blueberry juice that they use to stamp them, so it's perfectly edible. But it's not always the best appearance and may end up coloring your final product. And then we're going to start tying up the roast. For tying, it's always best to start in the center and define the tightness of the roll that you're trying to get and then you work slightly from one end to another and then fill in the gaps as you go along. I would treat the boneless shoulder roast as a dry roast. Salt, pepper, quick sear on all sides, put in a pan with aromatics and herbs and then cook until medium rare on the inside, deglaze a pan with ginger and beer and you have yourself a wonderful dinner. Here are the cuts from the breakdown of the shoulder. We're going to come back to the other side of the shoulder a little later on the bandsaw to make round bone chops, blade bone chops, and get the other foreshank off. Next, I'm going to break down the rib section. To break down the ribs, we're going to start by removing the spine or chime bone with the handsaw. What this does is allow us to expose the meat of the rack of lamb itself and also separate the spare ribs and breast from that center bone. Sawing through the lamb is tough at times because you have a good amount of fat on the outside which can lend itself to being a little slippery and at the same time since you don't have the weight of the animal being very heavy that just then stresses steady and thorough motions that you should use with a knife or saw. So now what we're going to do is define where the rack of lamb is going to stop and where the spare ribs are going to start. You definitely have the choice between using a bandsaw or a handsaw. Since they are small and brittle bones, you will be able to preserve the integrity and have a bit of a cleaner cut on the bandsaw. But here at Shambles, we try to do everything old school base. And just like with the rest of the animal, once I get through the bone, I'll stop and then switch over to a knife to finish my cut. I use the scimitar knife because it has a nice wide spine which gives it enough heft to get through heavier meat. Also, if I really need to, I could just slam down on the spine and finish through the rest of a bone. The ribs are definitely the most praised and popular part of the lamb, which on their own right, the great tiny morsels of that perfect lamb flavor that people seek out so much. And here, just being very careful, making well thought out long strokes with the handsaw, you're able to saw through the bones without getting a bunch of breakage or any splinters, which would then end up to be an adverse result. So now we're separating the spare rib tips from the actual spare ribs that we're going to do St. Louis style, just meaning that it's a nice rectangular rack of ribs and we're going to actually separate the ribs. There's a good amount of space in between, so I'm just lining everything up, making sure it's nice and straight. Making sure that all your ribs come out exactly even is quite important to make sure that no one gets an overcooked rib, whereas everybody else is enjoying a nice succulent fall off the bone rib. Nice and even cuts contribute to an easier time getting every single thing to come out exactly the same way. With this side of the spare ribs, what we're actually going to do is come underneath all those little rib bones and cut away the breast from the spare ribs. This is similar to what you would see on a pig as being the belly, but being that the lamb is not as large of an animal, you don't get that big of a result, but the flavor that you get from it is its result within itself. With this, you can cure it and make some bacon out of it. You can also stuff it and tie it as a roast. You can tie the breast around a more lean part of the animal if you don't think it has enough fat to really carry it and keep it moist. So now we are going to French a rack of lamb. Frenching is removing the meat from the tip of the bones to expose the bone and gives it a really nice appearance, pretty display. Here I'm removing a remnant of the shoulder blade. Also, after you chime the rack, there will be a tendon that runs down the top of the spine that needs to be removed as well. It just doesn't have any added benefit. It doesn't break down when you cook it, so it's best to leave it off entirely. 
Now what we're doing here is scoring in between each bone about an inch down just so that we can define where the end of our Frenching is going to be. What helps a lot is to make sure that you get through the membrane. Then you can peel it back along the side of the bones. And then when you're ready with your clean paper towel, you can then peel that whole section of meat that you scored on both sides and remove it totally. And then you should come out with nice, clean, perfect looking French rack of lamb bones there. The meat that comes off after Frenching is definitely great to be used in your grinds or your trim. It has a good amount of fat to it and there's a good amount of meat as well. Again, we're trying to work with zero waste, trying to get every usable piece of meat. So now with the other side of the rack, we are going to make the lamb wasette, which is basically the entire rack of lamb deboned and rolled around itself. Just like with the first one, we have a little bit of shoulder blade that we have to get through. So we're going to cut around that. And then what we're going to do is come right underneath the rib bones. And just as we were with the shoulder, going very close to the bone, preserving as much meat as possible, making sure that you get a nice sizable roast to feed everybody that is going to be at the dinner table. We're going to find our little tendon there and take it right out, just like the other one. And then we're just going to roll it from the meat side going around. Then we go ahead and make sure everything's secure by tying the roast up. Here's our breakdown of the rib section. Next, we're going to tackle the loin section of the lamb. The first thing we're going to do is remove some of the leftover glands and fascia that come from where the kidneys used to sit. Then we're going to do some internal shaping that will definitely yield you a nice meaty looking roast. The loin can end up as a lot of different things. You can make your loin double chops, which is basically a face cut off of the entire front side. And you can cut those in half for tiny little loin porterhouses you can also debone the entire sensor spine from the lamb and once again tie it, roast it, and do a lot of very cool, interesting things with it. The spring lambs tend to be a bit larger and will give you more meat and fat, more chops out of your loin. So depending on the time of year that you procure your lamb, you might end up with a larger lamb or a smaller lamb that will then determine how much yield you will get out of it. So here's the breakdown of the loin. Later we're going to take the loin onto the bandsaw and see what type of cuts we can get out of it. Here now we're going to tackle the legs. So the first thing we want to do with the legs is separate them and treat them individually. So what I'll do is make a little incision at the center of the legs just to separate the meat and show me where the center of the hip bone is. Then with a nice couple of wax with a cleaver, we're going to separate the bottom of the hip itself so that we can then start to cut away the sirloin and the rest of the leg from that hip. We're going to start to peel one leg away from the curved bones in that hip, which you just basically want to stay on the edge of just to make sure that you keep as much meat on the cut as possible. And I like to make a little guideline down the back of the spine to where the tail is so that I can designate where one leg stops and the other leg begins. So I'm just working around every little curved bone trying to keep all the meat into the leg and the sirloin itself. And there you have one side of the leg completely removed. Whole animal butchery is different in the way that you actually have two chances when you're working with a whole animal. So one leg of the lamb can turn into stew and kebabs and stir fry, whereas the other leg can turn into a roast. You can do some really incredible things and just have a wide range of options. Next, we're going to take a look at the leg and find the separation between the shank and the leg itself by making just again a tiny little incision. And here I'm using the gravity by bending the heavier part of the leg away from me and holding onto the shank, which then tends to expose exactly where I'm cutting. So here we're going to trim off some of the internal fat and fascia, some glands as well that might get in the way when tying a roast. So in the leg, there's a pretty sizable gland that should definitely be removed before you start cooking. It just won't provide us any nutritional benefit or value to then expose the femur bone. We started by making a nice long cut down one side of the bone and then we start slowly working down and around the edge of the femur bone to then free it up away from the inside of the leg. 
Then you'll be left with the kneecap at the bottom, which needs to come off. And now we're just going to trim away some of the fat that may not contribute to the particular cut that we're making, but definitely needs to be saved and used for any sort of grind or any other fat application you might have. And then we're going to go and trim away some of the fat on the outside just to give us a nice lean look to our lamb. Butchering tends to be more of a reductive process, like someone who works on ice sculptures would do. They have a big block and then by taking away, they then form something beautiful. So you're trying to take away as little as possible, but also know when it's necessary to take something away to give you the best result possible. So now with the other leg, we're going to take a bit of a different approach. We're still going to remove the shank once again. We're also going to take away anything that's unnecessary, fat, fascia, any sort of glands. The thing we're going to do differently with this one is instead of keeping all the muscles intact to then form a roast, we're going to separate the muscles from each other so that we can then judge which muscles will be used for which purpose be it stir fry, stew, or any particular type of roast or smaller cut that we'd wanna use a leaner muscle for. So we're gonna trim away some of that fascia and get away anything that would be intrusive to what we're trying to do with this specific lamb. So after that fat is gone, we have our seams exposed. So you take one seam and start to follow it down. Here is the bottom round, which is great for our kebabs or our stew. Also, if you cut against the grain, you get that really good stir fry that you're looking for as well. I'm basically just working my way around the lamb and removing the separate parts like the piece of filet that runs through the sirloin of the lamb that's considered the filet mignon on the lamb. It's very tender. So next I'm pulling out the top round. So just go slow, go shallow, follow a seam and eventually the muscle will peel away from the rest of the leg. So next I'm separating the rest of the large muscles from the femur and pulling the bone itself out. And then we can start cleaning up some of these major muscles and putting them into their respective applications. So I'm now going to take this cut and trim off any silver skin and I'm going to cut it into more manageable sections and we're going to turn this piece into stew. So we're going to do some nice good sized chunks that will break down, get a little bit smaller once they're cooked over low and slow heat and end up with some really nice meaty fall apart stew. After you have your muscles all cleaned up and exposed, it's great to take a look at the striations of the muscle and see what direction the muscle is heading into. If you're doing stir fry, you definitely want to cut against the striations to give you a smaller grain at the end of the day. What it will do is contribute to the tenderness and have it cook a little bit easier. The muscle fibers will end up to be shorter when you cut against the grain than longer, so it's less work for your teeth to have to chew through. The leg of the lamb is the leanest cut that you can get from it. So you won't have as much fat as you would any other part, which means you have a lot of muscles that are working quite hard. Therefore, these are cuts that you would typically use in a stew or a braise, something that would cook low and slow over a long period of time that will let that meat get very, very tender and fall off the bone. I like to think of butchery from a cook's perspective because at the end of the day someone's taking everything that we cut up for them and then they're having to make a meal out of it. So once you think about what this is going to go to, how it will look after it's cooked, it makes my job a lot easier to go into such detail and just make sure that even without me being there, the end result of what a customer will be doing with it will be fabulous. So here's the breakdown of the leg of lamb. Next, we're going to head over to the bandsaw and cut down the neck, the shoulder, and the loin. So putting the neck on the bandsaw allows us to get in smaller manageable pieces, easier to fit into a pot. If you don't have a bandsaw with a steady hand, you can definitely use a handsaw or a large enough pot to fit the entire neck in and just give it enough time to fully break down. The most important tip with it is to keep everything steady. Make sure that everything comes out even because even cuts cook at the same exact time as everything else around it. If you cut on one side of the shoulder, you will get your round bone chops. And if you turn your shoulder 45 degrees, you will be able to get your blade bone chops. So we're cutting these at about an inch in thickness, which yields you a nice good steak with some nice bones you can end up chewing on at the end of the meal. The loin we're also cutting at about an inch to get us some nice thick steaks. 
It's like a steak in that you don't have the marbling in the meat. All the fat will be on the outside. So a good approach to cooking this in a pan would be to flip it on its side and to get a nice sear and render down some of the fat. Gives you a nice crispy outer layer to it, but also remember that it will keep it moist. So basting also works very well. The most important thing to remember is to make sure that every cut comes out straight and even. Also cleaning off all the bone dust that will gather onto your cut as you've made it. Lamb chops should be treated pretty much as a steak to try and get your internal temperature correct that you're looking for. To try and get that nice sear that you're looking for on the outside. Flavor pairings then start to open up quite nicely. Adding some blue cheese really gets to add on to that whole funk vibe that you get from lamb. You can also use a wide range of sauces as you would finish a steak in, and herbs also make a great addition. The antioxidants in the herbs work against the oxidizing of the saturated fats within that lamb shoulder. And these are all the cuts that we will get from the bandsaw. With all the trim that we have left over from breaking down the entire lamb, we're going to grind that up and then we're going to make ourselves some merguez sausage. So we have our merguez all mixed up and ready to go and we're basically stuffing our sausage stuffer making sure that we don't have any air holes or any pockets which could result in someone's sausage bursting on them when they're cooking. So after our sausage stuffer is nice and full, we'll start to then even out our sausage then comes to put the casing on the horn. It's best to run a little bit of water through the casing to make sure that everything's nice and lubricated and you have no issues with the casing catching. So we're going to be using a lamb casing, which is the small intestines of the lamb. It's quite a finicky thing to work with, but with a little bit of practice and a steady hand, you shouldn't have any issues. Making sure that everything is cold is one of the most important parts of making a sausage. The warmer your sausage gets, one, it becomes a food safety issue, but then the fat starts smearing and then you don't have the separation between the meat and the fat that then helps to cook the sausage when heat is applied to it. And that's a completed merguez sausage. And finally, here are all the cuts that you would typically see in a butcher's case from a whole lamb. 